Terima kasih kepada semua yang sudi menghadiri webinar ini. Good afternoon and welcome to this educational research webinar organized by the Association of Alumni of Faculty of Education, University of Malaya. Thank you very much for taking time to be with us in this intellectual discourse on strengthening the quality of education in Malaysia, research challenges and recommendations. This will be a one and a half hour session. Before we start this webinar, a few words from the organizer. Please mute yourselves so that the background noise, wherever you are, will not disturb the flow of the webinar. As you listen, you probably have some burning questions. Please do write down in the chat area. We will pick up the questions to be answered by the speakers. We might also ask one or two of you to ask your questions verbally at the end of the session, depending on time, on the time available. Yeah. Um, the Alumni uh, Association was only set up less than a year ago, as this is our very first activity. So we would like to invite our president, Dr. Zainal Alam bin Hassan, to say a few words before we start our webinar. Dr. Zainal. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And very good afternoon. Uh, terima kasih kepada yang bahagia Datin Dr. Hansibun. Yang bahagia Prof. Dr. Wahida, uh, Dekan Fakulti Pendidikan Sri Maya. Dan sebenarnya rakan-rakan uh, daripada Fakulti Pendidikan dan para peserta uh, webinar. Terima kasih kerana hadir ke Educational Research Webinar Strengthening the Quality of Education in Malaysia. Ini merupakan satu norma baru dalam seminar kita dan ini merupakan pertama kali Persatuan Alumni Fakulti Pendidikan menganjurkan seminar dalam bentuk norma baru ini untuk membantu rakan-rakan kita di luar sana dalam melaksanakan kajian mereka. So for the international student, we welcome you to the Education Research Webinar. This one is the first webinar organized by the uh, alumni Faculty of Education Association. We hope that uh, you all can get gaining the information, knowledge about research, how to uh, did the research in uh, we hope uh, We hope that looking forward uh, to see you all again in another webinar. Soon. To make sure that uh, these alumni uh, can uh, give you something, especially uh, the student from the Faculty of Education. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, looking forward to see you again next time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zainal. The webinar will not be successful if we do not have the Faculty of Education. In fact, the setup of the Alumni Association was also strongly promoted by Prof. Rohaida. So we like to invite the Dean of the Faculty of Education, University of Malaya, Professor Dr. Rohaida bin Muhammad Saad to grace this event. Prof, please. Okay, terima kasih. Thank you, Latin Dr. Ng Subun. Okay. Okay, first of all, I would like to say welcome to the Educational Research Webinar. And and I would like to thank the Persatuan eh, Alumni Fakulti Pendidikan uh, led by Tuan Haji Dr. Zainal, Zainal Alam and also the, uh, uh, the ex-co members eh, for putting this together. And uh, as the Dean of Faculty of Education, we really appreciate, appreciate this, uh, this, uh, um, this activity because it, it will definitely benefit, especially the postgraduate students. Actually, uh, as, I, as far as I, I know, uh, as I remembered, this is more for the you know sharing, sharing of uh, experiences and uh, for our postgraduate students. Okay, so I was made to believe that uh, this, uh, uh, although the intention was for the postgraduate students within UM, but since it has been dis uh, disseminated all over, 
uh, I was uh, I was told that uh, a number of international students also has has uh, has been uh, they have uh, also joined us. So I would like to welcome the international students too. Okay, and for uh, as for the our own our postgraduate students, I hope this uh, this webinar will shed some light. You know, because I just finished my class just now. <laughs> okay, uh, it's on uh, uh, on research method. So I hope that this uh, this webinar will shed some light on how and how, uh, how, what are the things that can be done for for their uh, for their research in the coming coming mm -hmm. research. Okay. Because, uh, so without further ado, I do not want to talk much. Without further ado, I would like to uh, say Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Um, I would like to uh, officiate this educational research webinar with the theme of strengthening the quality of education in Malaysia, research challenges and recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Rahida. Research is key to postgraduate studies as it is an exercise testing our cognitive faculty as well as our persistence to complete a task in a systematic, logical, critical and creative way. However, to spend a minimum of two or three years in a central piece of work is not easy task. It takes our commitment and the question that always arises is, why am I doing this study? What study do I want to do? Am I wasting my time? Would the finding of my study impact policy? These were also questions that uh, prompted the association to decide on the theme of this webinar, which also guided our choice of speakers. Therefore, we specially invite two speakers from the Ministry of Education, as well as two more from the academic world to speak to us. I will introduce each of them as I invite them to speak. So what we will do is that we will be uh, asking the first speaker, Dr. Uh, Dr. Rohaya, and then followed by uh, Dr. Shu'ed, and then we will have a, a short, maybe two questions. And then subsequently, we will have uh, Dr. Vinil and Dr. Diane, and then we will follow up with more questions. All right, and also just to, just to uh, let all of us know, the participants of this uh, webinar actually made up of about um, 37 from the Faculty of Education, University Malaya, and also five from the other faculty in University Malaya, and also 42 from the other universities, uh, either uh, the public or the private university, and we also have some uh, not from the university, yeah. So we do have people from other universities, okay? So now let us start our webinar. Our first speaker is Dr. Rohaya bin Dis Hassan. I will introduce her briefly, yeah. Dr. Rohaya is the Deputy Director of Teacher Professionalism Division Ministry of Education. In short, DPG, yeah, DPG. She's in charge of Teacher Development Policy Unit. She joined BPG in January this year. Um, before that, she was in PADU, which is the performance and, the, and delivery unit for two and a half years as the executive director of teachers and school leaders sector. She has also served as deputy director of fully residential and school excellence management, uh, BPS, BPMOE, in charge of planning, monitoring, and overseeing the existing and future directions of excellent schools in the ministry. She has served MOE for 30 years. Yeah, she was also in textbook division. She was also in IAB. Therefore, she really has a lot of uh, experience, either from the management or teacher training and policies. So we, uh, her, interest, uh, her interest is in instructional technology. She graduated uh, with a PhD in uh, instructional technology and you and her area of interest include instructional technology, education management and leadership and research methodology, especially qualitative research. And her new interest now is educational neuroscience. That's very interesting. And a life motto, I like it, in whatever you do, do your best. So Dr. Royaya, over to you. You have about 
10 minutes. Yeah, Dr. Rohaya. Are you there, Dr. Rohaya? Can you um, see? Okay. Thank you, Datin Dr. Ng, um, for that kind introduction. Um, welcome to the uh, our webinar this afternoon. Um, I'll be talking um, in perspective of the Ministry of Education, particularly where teachers are concerned um, in teacher professionalism division or BPG. Um, it used to be teacher education division um, uh, with the same acronym uh, BPG, but um, um, for the new uh, restructuring of the ministry, it was changed to teacher professionalism division, which is a bit mouthful to, to say, but um, luckily the acronym is still BPG. Now our core business in BPG is actually uh, mainly with a new um, function is uh, to ensure that the um, teachers, um, 430,000 of them more or less, um, get all the CPDs or continuous professional development um, in one way or another in, in all of their uh, time um, in service, whether they are uh, novice teachers, whether they are uh, experienced teachers in schools, um, but they are also need to be uh, uh, clustered into um, um, either leaders teachers uh, or advanced uh, leaders in terms of um, their grades. Um, or those are the DG 52s and 54. So we uh, in BPG um, are coming up with um, very structured uh, CPDs for all these levels of teachers. Um, that cross uh, all various positions in the ministry, including um, those uh, in the districts or PPD uh, in JPN or the state levels, and also in the ministries of the in the Bahagians. Um, ideally, yes, we are targeting to all the 430,000 teachers uh, out there, uh, particularly in schools. We don't run the courses. We have training providers um, for teachers. Our main tra training provider is the IPGM or the teacher training colleges, um, the teacher training campuses. Um, for education leaders um, or for the areas of education management and leadership, our training provider mainly is Institute Anwar Um, But we do have uh, a lot of um, um, private training provider as well for uh, leadership particularly, um, including RSOG, the Razak School of Government, uh, being one of the leading uh, private uh, training providers for leadership. Um, since we are a bit constrained with time, uh, I'll zoom in straight into the agenda at hand um, with the um, a little bit of presentation. Um, of the PowerPoint, if uh, Dot can can upload that uh, PowerPoint for me because I find it I'm not sure how to import that. Okay, thanks, Dot. Okay, um, I took the liberty to uh, rephrase um, uh, the mouthful topic of of the big topic that we have today into uh, my own slot into teacher quality. Um, and what does it mean to researchers uh, in terms of what do we what do we explore? How do we explore teacher quality uh, in general? Uh, next on, next page, please. Okay. Um, for our strategy for teachers, one of the main agenda in the ministry right now. Um, this is five to ten years of. Uh, uh, um, Train, uh, planning and also um, executing um, in phases um, of what we want uh, the teachers or our teachers to be in five years time, 10 years time, um, is becoming scholarly teachers. This is one of the agendas that, that are being um, put into the strategic plan for five years, uh, five to 10 years um, last year when the ministry are uh, uh, together with the Ministry of Higher Education. Um, however, we, we uh, continue with this aspiration and also with this strategic plan um, for MOE to um, uh, 
somehow uh, propagate or um, and to, to enhance our teachers to become more scholarly. Um, by scholarly, we don't only mean to upscale or upskill our teachers into um, in the academic uh, qualifications, but we also want our teachers to become uh, more scholarly in terms of how do they uh, make decisions in the classroom um, that they need to um, uh, employ some form of uh, data collection and need to be based on uh, somewhat an informed uh, um, uh, information or data in order to make uh, informed decisions uh, rather than just uh, make random decisions. So for MOE uh, in this um, um, agenda, we uh, target to upskill academic qualifications of teachers uh, where we say that by 2030, 25% of our teachers to have a master's degree. That encompass, uh, encompasses uh, about 80,000 of our teachers uh, to have a master's degree, master's degree by 2030. Um, right now, the percentage is only 7.55%. Um, that is 2020, uh, meaning that um, if 7.55%, um, that is about 32,600 um, more or less um, of our, all, the, all the teachers. By teachers, I mean the Pegawai Perkhidmatan Awam, uh, the PPP across the board, not only in schools, but also in PPDs, in JPNs, um, or in the states, district states, and as well as um, the ministry, uh, those who are in the ministries. Um, so it, it's, if we look at the number, 25% um, is only about 80,000 out of 430,000. Um, that's not, um, um, that's our target. Uh, we have KPIs to, to achieve that target. Um, but we also uh, aspire to have 100% teachers with uh, first degree. Right now, we still have uh, about 8% of our teachers who are non-graduates. Um, but these, uh, having said so, but the, uh, these, this number um, are facing out in less than three years because they are at an age where they, they will retire uh, in uh, three, less than uh, three years and less. Um, and um, if we go back to the agenda of becoming scholarly teachers, mainly what we attempt to in, in the ministry is to expose uh, the need for teachers to become um, more intimate uh, for uh, activities that are more scholarly. For example, we want to encourage a lot of teachers uh, to be taking action research as a natural activity in the classroom. We want to encourage teachers to have more book review sessions in um, PLC settings, uh, informal or uh, formal. Uh, we want to encourage teachers to write more um, articles, um, to be able to discuss uh, journals, to be able to contribute to uh, journal writing and so on, to be, to be intellectually discussing um, a lot of issues pertaining teaching and learning, uh, pertaining to uh, um, learners' um, uh, way of adapting more so now with the pandemic situations where Students are not in school, students are at home, and teachers are manning their teaching and learning um, uh, distantly. Um, and a lot, um, and as Prof. Rohaida in the beginning was saying that a lot of complaints come from our learners um, or parents, uh, in fact, um, that you know their children are becoming so restless at home. Uh, how do we make um, that teaching and learning from distant setting uh, interesting and conducive enough for our, our students to be able to uh, regard that learning as uh, still fun um, and necessary. Um, also, we want to encourage teachers to present uh, papers um, uh, be innovative, be conceptual in what they do, uh, be more conscious of their teaching and learning in the classrooms, um, as well as um, 
becoming uh, more prominent in the uh, uh, PLC settings, um, either uh, in the school or within the schools, districts, and so on. Um, so uh, these are some of the things that um, uh, the, the, uh, the ministry are um, putting in um, a lot of effort and, and money uh, towards uh, promoting um, um, the idea of scholarly teachers as well as the aspirations to upskill and upscale um, our teachers' qualification. Uh, next, um, Dot. Okay. Um, we, uh, there are also challenges for our teachers, we understand um, uh, naturally, because if in school, um, uh, we're talking about the, the natural setting, um, and I'll move into the the uh, current setting um, that everybody is at home at the moment. Um, we find that our teachers uh, always have uh, to chase things to in in, in the school hours, um, and for them to sit down and read, for them to be doing data collection activities, for them to be squeezing in all these. Um, um, activities or scholarly activities within the context of them becoming full-time teachers um, and teaching um, as their core business in school become a bit of a challenge for our schools, for our teachers to do that in school. Um, and another uh, point is that they, they also find that completing a research report is also a challenge. Um, uh, not so much to sit down and actually write it, but I think again, it, it, it ties up with the time um, uh, constraint that they find um, they just simply don't have the time to, to actually sit down and um, uh, write this report or complete this report. Uh, next slide. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, by, by talking uh, very briefly on that, um, I will uh, certainly uh, answer um, some questions if there are any opportunity to that. Um, I've um, uh, drawn down some, some of uh, these um, questions and also uh, some thoughts into how do our students or our research students um, uh, can explore some of these um, uh, issues that I briefly explained uh, before uh, in terms of um, um, things that or areas that I deem as um, quite challenging for researchers to do. For example, um, how do we find that or how do we tap that uh, teachers uh, practices, um, uh, research practices in the classroom? Um, if we ask teachers uh, verbally or um, ask them to fill up the Google Doc, they will say that yes, they do the research, uh, they do research, they do action research, they do some kind of um, um, research in the classroom, uh, but we we don't get or we don't get to probe uh, into what sort of uh, areas or activities uh, of research that they get uh, themselves into um, naturally or um, frequently in terms of, uh, especially when when they want to have data um, to make a lot of decisions. Uh, how teachers make decisions in uh, on the students' learning. A lot of the time, teachers uh, uh, often uh, find that they they need to finish syllabus. They need to come up with question papers, um, exam question papers, um, marking um, uh, papers, and so on. So uh, little time for them to ponder um, when it comes to the actual students' learning in the classroom why students don't grasp certain concepts in, in, in certain topics um, of science or maths, for example. Um, so how do researchers tap on these thoughts that teachers have in terms of their own students' learning? Um, also, I've read a few things um, uh, before in terms of, um, um, there's a lot of significant uh, research uh, findings um, that says um, if you invest in meaningful relationships with students, um, that in itself facilitate learning. So I don't know how this phenomena affects our teachers in Malaysia, um, more so now that you know teachers and students are rarely meet in person. But of course, you can actually um, uh, build and, and uh, build that bond or relationships um, um, through the 
uh, online settings. Um, but uh, if we can have uh, more data on this, more information um, through research, uh, it will be interesting to find out. Um, and also, uh, this is also close to my heart. I, I, I like to read something about teachers' belief and their inner thoughts towards the profession. Because um, in ministry, we know that we're very highly centralized. So a lot of things teachers get are from the ministry. Uh, cascaded to GPNs and then executed in, uh, at PPD levels and, and it goes down to the schools. So it, seem, it seems like uh, uh, it seems like a top down kind of, of situation, but um, at the same time we want how, how teachers um, in receiving all those instructions or things that they need to execute in school setting. Um, coincide with what do, what uh, uh, coincide with their own beliefs um, in teaching, their own beliefs in teaching and learning, their own beliefs in their students or even in their own profession. So it will be interesting for researchers uh, to find out uh, whether these things make a cohesive uh, ecosystem in the education system in Malaysia. Um, of course, um, the teacher quality uh, uh, um, catechism of um, what do we mean um, in terms of teacher quality in Malaysia? Uh, what sort of quality that we are aspiring for? Um, how to sustain and there is such a, a quality in terms of curriculum, in terms of teacher training, in terms of assessment. How do we sustain um, these uh, quality teachers um, mainly maintaining it throughout their service, uh, life service? Uh, we, we find that um, um, we, uh, are grappling at the um, issue of a sustaining and maintaining quality. We might have qualities um, when our novice teachers become experienced, they begin to explore their own, their own uh, craft in teaching. Um, and that goes for about three to five years. And then there's gonna be a, a little uh, effort to, um, from or support rather uh, for them to be uh, to sustain uh, that quality that they have whatever qual quality quality uh, in areas that they are uh, being assessed uh, at um, and 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 I think mainly um, they lack support uh, teachers lack support uh, from various levels. Um, and, and therefore perhaps uh, it's very difficult to maintain quality of teaching and learning or quality of learning in itself if they don't get the right support um, from various levels. I think um, for that 10 minutes, um, that's all I can share with, with everybody. Um, I am uh, ready to or uh, free to get uh, some questions um, if, if um, there are questions. Thank you. Thank you, for, thank you Dr. Rohaya. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Rohaya for um, when I look at the slides, I think I think she has given a lot of uh, suggestions for possible research area. That is also one of the purpose we have this webinar. Probably students can obtain some inputs about what are the areas that we can research on in Malaysia. There is one uh, burning question that has been asked, um, which is... Um, would any of their findings be used? What is the chance of, of it being used by policymakers? But I won't ask Dr. Rohaya to answer now. Let us listen to the next one first, and then later we will come back to that questions. Our next speaker is, uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Rohaya. Yeah? Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Shu'ib. Yeah? Dr. Shu'ib um, is also, Dr. Shuib is also our uh, deputy president in the Association of the Lumini. Dr. Shuib Asimiran was born in Tanjung Karang, Kelangor, yeah, at the coastal area. She was, uh, he was raised during his early childhood in Felda, Sungai Buaya, Rawang. So he's a Kampung boy at heart, I suppose. Mm -hmm. He went on to his schools in uh, Initially in Felda, Sungai Boya, 
Later on, she went to St. John Institution KL, and he actually continued his college education at Mark International Academy of Arts and Sciences in Toronto, Canada. From 1981 till 1982, under the Malaysian Government Scholarship Program. And he then attended his university education at York University, Toronto, and also uh, later on in Sheffield Hallam University, United Kingdom. In 2009, he graduated for his PhD degree from the University of Malaya, Kuala Lumpur, in the field of educational policy, planning, and administration. He is currently in UPM, and uh, he is actively involved <coughs> sorry, in research seminars, conference, and consultancy works. His research interests are in the area of university govern governance, higher education management, leadership, quality management in higher education, and entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial education. He served currently as the Deputy Dean Students and Alumni Affairs and the Deputy Dean Academic and International in the Faculty of Educational Studies in UPM. He has published more than 60 papers and uh, also uh, he has books, yeah. So, um, without further ado, let us invite uh, Dr. Shui to present. Okay, thank you, uh, Datin, for the introduction. Everybody can, I guess, can see my slide, right? Okay, uh, Assalamualaikum. Uh, very good afternoon to uh, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Prof. Raida, and thank you for the uh, invitation uh, to invite me to become one of the panelists. All right, uh, I will go straight into the uh, issues and, and the concerns uh, in conducting uh, research, especially uh, to us. Uh, um, I think uh, mostly the participants are. Uh, uh, students who are doing uh, masters and a PhD who actually in uh, a certain point of time would like to become uh, academics. So I would I will be speaking in terms of the uh, our responsibility, our concerns as uh, academicians about uh, conducting uh, research in terms of the, uh, the academic activity itself, in terms of the uh, academic worthiness and then other aspects as well which is, uh, I think is very uh, important and very relevant to our discussion today. As we talk about uh, strengthening the quality of uh, education research in, uh, in this country or in any other countries. I mean, uh, I would like to start with the, uh, the importance of uh, academic research. These are some uh, of the importance in terms of uh, doing research in academic works. There are many others, but I just want to touch uh, within this uh, a few minutes, I think about 10 minutes, I will, I will try to cover uh, as much as possible within, uh, I think, uh, in five slides to so that we can have some uh, foundation to discuss uh, if we have issues, if we have uh, problems in conducting uh, research activities. So basically, uh, I think everybody knows one of the things why we do research is because of the nature of knowledge. Knowledge, uh, we develop knowledge, we discover knowledge, we disseminate knowledge and so on. So for the purpose of the sake of knowledge, I mean, since the beginning of the early days in education, I think we are always talking about, we are always discussing about uh, knowledge. So uh, the nature of knowledge itself is very important. Okay, And then number two, if you want to say about learning, right? I mean, Dr. Rohaya touched on the teachers' uh, continuous professional development. Of course, there are action research, there are um, many other research that we conducted in terms of how to facilitate uh, learning aspects, eh? uh, whether in schools or in higher education or in any other uh, training institutions in, uh, to facilitate the learning. Now we are talking about, uh, for example, the usage of uh, artificial intelligence in teaching. Eh? Uh, we are talking about how we can uh, assimilate, how we can integrate the IR4, eh? I mean, uh, development into education and, and many other things. We are talking also about uh, a future classroom, for example. Okay? So those are things that maybe uh, in, in the future is very important and very significant and 
influencing the process of uh, learning, uh, whether in schools or in higher education institutions. Okay. And also, if you look from the uh, policy perspective, for example, there are issues. There are many issues in education. There are which we have to highlight and at a certain point, uh, we analyze policies, we become the, uh, if you want to say, uh, the, the group of people who will be looking into policies and analyze the policies to see uh, the, 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 uh, the development of the policies, the implementation of the policies, especially. Uh, for example, uh, before this, we have these uh, policies on PPSMI, I mean, they were so many research conducted on that one. And then we also talk about the uh, school effectiveness. We talk about uh, instructional leadership, for example. So there are issues in terms of uh, schools, uh, in terms of um, the achievement uh, of education. We are talking also about issues on uh, job uh, motivation among teachers. We are talking about the organizational commitment uh, among educators, whether in, in schools or in uh, universities, for example, uh, there are many, many issues. Yeah? Uh, now, um, for example, now we are in the situation where we are facing the VUCA world. Uh, and the, I mean, uh, if you ask, if you want to, to see the what is happening now, the pandemic, yeah, the, uh, the pandemic situation uh, globally, uh, I think there are so many issues about uh, education, whether at the uh, lower level or at the um, post-secondary level, even at the university level. Yeah? So there are millions of students affected by the uh, pandemic situation. So there are issues. I mean, uh, we have to come up with policies, the short term policy, for example, uh, medium term and long term policies touching on uh, education and, and so on. So and as well, um, we don't uh, forget that uh, most of our students, uh, the, the participants today, uh, they are doing research for their academic growth. They want to become academics. Uh, we also were researchers before. Uh, so when we were doing our postgraduate studies, we have to conduct uh, research and so on it's for our academic purposes. So these are some of the uh, importance uh, of academic uh, research in um, as academics. Uh, I mean, uh, that the way that I, I see it. Okay, um, there are few basic things, basic tenets that we have to uh, look into uh, when conducting research as academics or in the academic world. Okay. Uh, I, will, I will highlight four of this one. Uh, there are many others as well. So one thing is about honesty. In, in terms of doing research, we, what is the purpose of doing research? You talk about knowledge, we want to search the truth, for example. So you, we have to be truthful in disclosing the methods in doing our research and also in presenting our findings. There are many purposes of doing research. I mean, uh, we have involved in uh, research with government agencies, research with private agencies, research on our own as, I mean, our curiosity, we want to find something new, for example. So um, some sometimes uh, there are things happening along the way when we do our research, okay? but somehow or other, uh, we must be honest. Honesty is the, the pillars uh, in doing uh, research. Yeah? So we, we must be truthful uh, in, in uh, disclosing the methods that we are using as well as the uh, in presenting the findings of our research. Uh, number two is about the accuracy. Accuracy is basically to assess the accuracy and encompassing the reliability and validity of the researcher's findings. The researcher must describe how the research was conducted. Uh, a detailed methodology section must be included, especially in reporting our findings. Normally, when we propose, when we submit our research proposal, we we mention this in the method. But, uh, along the way, we have to stick to that method. If there are things that we have to uh, adjust because of the uh, what you call this uh, the, the happenings along the way, then we we should also mention about the uh, the changes that have been uh, made, especially in terms of uh, reporting yeah, when the researcher. Uh, report the, the findings. Huh? Okay, this, that is in terms of uh, accuracy. Um, number three is the transparency aspect. Transparency in research conduct. I mean, how do we collect the data? How do we select the sample, for example? This is very important. 
that's why in I think uh, many of the the students now, uh, uh, one of the things that you have to be really uh, familiar is the way how you select your population, the way you select your samples, the way you uh, collect your data. I mean, do you get the permissions? Eh? This is a uh, very important. I mean, now there are also issues about um, the ethical committee. Yeah? I mean, for example, in uh, in my university, that we I think in everywhere it's not the same. In conducting our research, we have to get the approval from the ethics committee, so that uh, the, the the things that the we are doing, uh, the, the data later on, I mean the report and so on, are basically uh, not uh, con, um, not uh, leading to uh, something that is not uh, in line with our uh, laws, for example, uh, rules and regulations, because we have uh, certain norms that we have to, uh, to follow. Okay. And then uh, number four is objectivity. We must uh, not acknowledge our personal and professional biases as well as our political um, uh, Being a researcher, uh, we must be able to detach our professional and our personal uh, aspects yeah? because we must be object objective in terms of the things of the, 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 the subjects that we are researching, the, the focus of our research, and we must not be, uh, we are, must not. Uh, have our own, uh, put in our, our own bias in terms of uh, conducting, in terms of our reporting, as well as in terms of our uh, interests. Uh, there, are, there are things that normally uh, sometimes will affect uh, the, uh, the way we conduct uh, the research. So the professionalism must be there. Okay? And this is uh, very important. Also, uh, being academics, we must be political, we must not uh, incline uh, uh, to uh, to support certain political organization, for example, if we are conducting research, uh, I mean, uh, we are conducting research for the sake of knowledge. Then we should be first. We should be honesty. Must be there. We must be accurate in reporting, and we must be transparent in and in conducting the research and being objective in our uh, what we call this uh, the way we conduct our uh, activities uh, in, in in research. Yeah? And then. Uh, there are various issues uh, that we have to follow as well, uh, especially uh, for the students uh, who are doing uh, the research at the uh, PhD level, for example. And this is a global issues. Uh, these are five of the uh, issues that I would like to highlight. Uh, one is the issue of plagiarism. Um, I don't I have to explain what is plagiarism, but basically uh, plagiarism is a phenomenal issue in terms of uh, students' assignments, in terms of uh, students uh, thesis and so on okay so um, citing other people's work without acknowledging right? uh, taking other people's work without uh, citing it you know these are the things that uh, that actually uh, become uh, global issues yeah? I mean uh, the way I see that sometimes uh, doing uh, students assignments yeah? we, we we can detect whether the assignments is genuine assignments written by the students or actually was uh, taken from the internet and they just uh, copy and paste and submit to the lecturer to see that that's the, uh, well, which is um, very uh, plagiarism. Uh? This is very serious. Even a thesis uh, at the PhD level or the master's level also. Um, I mean, uh, I, I came across one before. Uh, I, I do not know. Uh, my, my, my thesis was, I, th I think, was uh, uh, taken by somebody. Uh, and then uh, the, I think uh, from South Africa, and they they they, 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 call it, they contact me about the the whole thing. I'm I'm not sure what was the the, the outcome of that one. But plagiarism is one issues in terms of uh, the way we do our uh, research. Uh, second is about co copyright infringement. Yeah? Corporate, this is also another issue so, which is uh, very pertinent to especially academics in the universities because we there are points for us. We have our KPIs, for example. So copyrights is, is one thing. So copyright infringement. So somebody else works, and then you claim it to be yours. Then this is also uh, dangerous. This is also uh, unethical. Yeah? And then the research ethics is uh, very much clear. Okay, uh, there are things that we have to follow. Uh, we must not touch on certain issues. We must not uh, go against the the cultural background and so on. So we must not uh, go against the uh, norms of the society uh, in, in our country, for example. So these are very important things uh, uh, in terms of uh, research ethics, uh, not uh, doing uh, something that is going against the 
uh, the moral uh, aspects uh, in our uh, society, uh, for example. Uh, there are issues also about conflicts of uh, interest. Uh, this normally uh, you uh, misuse, the, for example, misuse the fund, misuse the uh, the trust given to you. Uh, there are things that basically uh, trying to, to gain benefits to yourself. Uh, um, there are things that basically you are looking, doing a research that will be uh, beneficial to you. Uh, this is something that we have to look upon as well uh, to avoid that, that the conflict of uh, interest. And then uh, finally, normally when we uh, finish with our research, there are uh, issues on uh, the intellectual property protection, for example, uh, if you are conducting uh, research with, for the government agencies, who's who is the owner uh, of the research findings and so on. If we are doing it on our own, yeah, um, then it's our, could be our uh, our uh, property, but then we are funded by the universities or we are funded by certain agencies. So we have to look into that aspect as well. And when, even if you uh, finish with your studies, yeah, the PhD studies and so on, if you are doing in in STEM layer, so who own the, the the IP for the thesis. So basically, these are the issues um, that we have to uh, seriously take uh, into account and consideration uh, in doing our uh, our research. So these are uh, five things that I, I think uh, we have to uh, bear in mind. The plagiarism is a global phenomenon. A copyright infringement is also happening. Research ethics, I think we have to really uh, put this into uh, a serious considerations and then conflict of interest uh, also another uh, issues that have to be uh, addressed in doing uh, research and finally about the ip uh, protection issue okay thank you Dr. Um, I, yeah okay i give you uh my time up already is it yeah, i just want to highlight a few uh, research highlight yeah 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 a few uh, uh, one of the misconduct in research is publication Fabrication is making up data or results and recording them or reporting them. Number two, falsifications, manipulating research materials, equipment, and so on, and plagiarism, as I mentioned before. Okay, I just maybe you, if there are questions, I will answer later on. Okay, these are some of the take points that you can uh, uh, digest. Uh, research should always take full consideration on the legal and other relevant issues. A credible research is free from plagiarism and misconduct. A successful research project successfully manages the conflicts of interest uh, for the various stakeholders and finally intellectual property protection is uh, paramount to protect the findings uh, of the uh, general uh, aspect of the researcher and the research institution itself. So that's that's my, my point for, for now and uh, I wish uh, good luck if there are questions that I can uh, answer, I will uh, answer. Thank you Datin, thank you Dr. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, taking no, taking right. longer time there. No, no. I, 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 uh, I thought that was a break just now. All right, Dr. Shui, thank yes. you so much for your presentation. Dr. Shui's point is that it's not only about research, but you must do a good research, rigorous and valid, correct? Valid yeah. data. And that is very important. If we cannot do that, then that piece of work that we spend so much of time to do may not be valuable. Yeah, okay. Now, uh, before we ask the third speaker, I have seen some questions. So there is this question that uh, Dr. Rohaya, can you answer it, please? Because uh, there is this uh, participant who say that I'm happy to see educational neuroscience is being given attention and the interest of the speaker, Dr. Rohaya. May mm -hmm. I know any idea about this interest in MOE? Whether it's MOE picking it up, Dr. Rohaya, maybe you can. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, yes. Uh, neuroscience seems to be um, the area that is being explored into um, in the ways to understand um, learning and also how students learn effectively. What happens to your brain when you learn something and so on and so forth. Um, at the moment, is a new area in 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 uh, in the education, but we're trying to explore more of um, uh, in terms of how do we 
facilitate this interest uh, in the area for CPD, so continuous professional development amongst teachers to expose this kind of area of interest so that teachers are in the position to explore more in this area. Um, and um, I think it's not limited to only perhaps uh, the interest of science teachers. Um, neuroscience um, is a science of learning. So all teachers, um, uh, to me, uh, should be interested in, in finding out what happens to um, uh, scientifically what happens to uh, a student uh, in, in his or her brain, in, in his or her emotions, uh, how, how that affects uh, the way that they learn. Um, it's kind of uh, interrelated to uh, multiple intelli inter intelligences as well. Um, and it's, uh, it's being explored by um, our policymakers as well. Um, I think our, our Director General, uh, Dr. Habiba, is also um, very interested in this area. Um, so I, I can, I can uh, say that uh, we, we are uh, putting uh, more attention in this area uh, these days. Um, hopefully, um, I'm, I'm trying to put uh, some um, uh, courses, some effective courses or some known courses uh, on neuroscience next year for our CPDs, inshallah. Does that help? <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Rohaya. Yeah. So that means that uh, for the uh, person who asked these questions, so the uh, neuroscience is definitely there, taken attention by the Ministry of Education. So if you have any research on that, I think it would really be very useful. And talking about research, I think uh, Dr. Rohaya earlier mentioned about um, our MOEs wish to, to have scholarly teachers, meaning that the teachers will practice based on evidence, practice. Mm -hmm based on research, that is, you research as you teach. So that would mean that the kind of research that would be of interest to the Ministry of Education and also would be very useful to the postgraduate students will be something which is uh, in the line of uh, improving your teaching and learning. So along that line, action research or research on instructional design should be something that is uh, being uh, encouraged by the Ministry of Education. Can I say that, uh, Dr. Rohaya? Yes, definitely. Um, we are trying all avenues to make learning effective. Uh, so at the moment, if neuroscience is one of the main agenda in the world that trying to understand um, how learning takes place in, 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 in the students or in the learners, then yes, the ministry is investing in, in uh, will surely invest in exploring um, those areas as well. Yeah, but uh, I also heard that uh, there was some, there was some comment um, that uh, action research is not considered as a very rigorous study for postgraduates, especially for a PhD. So what do you think, Dr. Shoei? Well, certainly uh, there are various types of research. And then if you want to say that action, uh, action research is not uh, important, uh, I think uh, uh, even at the PhD level, I, of course there are many research I mean, have been conducted uh, at the PhD level as well. So it depends and I mean, uh, how deep is the, the process uh, you, you conduct the research because in, in doing research, uh, there are various stages, for example, in action research that you have to uh, fulfill. If you, if you follow everything and if it is basically fulfilling what is uh, said in the literature about action research, I think uh, there is no problem with that. I mean, the way we do it uh, is, is important. Huh? It's not just uh, touch and go research. Um, so uh, any kinds of research, uh, if the, the process of doing it is, is correct, I mean, uh, if you follow all these uh, procedures, if you follow all the uh, suitable steps, the relevant steps and so on, I think there is no uh, problem with the, uh, I mean, the, the, 
the level of uh, research itself. I hope it's, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, because I don't want, I mean, let on, no students want to do action research because they think that it's not qualified for PhD. Uh, I, I'm, I'm against that one because to me, uh, I think any kind of research as, as long as it is fulfilling the requirements of the uh, research process itself, I think it suffice to, to be granted or to be awarded the degree of uh, PhD. Okay, thank you, Dr. Syed. So I think uh, fellow postgraduate students and also lecturers, so the main point that we have got from both uh, Dr. Rohaya and also uh, Dr. Syed is that uh, the research that we do, if it is beneficial to improve the quality of teaching, it should be worthy to be studied. It should be worthy, worth your effort to do the research. Yeah. Okay, now let's move on first to our third speaker before we continue with our Q&A. Yeah? So our third speaker is none other than Dr. Ilha Venil Narina Sami. Dr. Ilha Venil attended University of Malaya and graduated with a degree in TEFL in 1998. He has spent almost 30 years in the field of education, that's long time, yeah? comprising primary and secondary education. While working in a secondary school, she continued her journey towards achieving academic excellence by completing an ED and later on PhD from University of Malaya in 2013. I think we, most of us here, that is because of our passion of education that we continue to do our master and PhD. Now, being a trained educationist in English and moral studies, Dr. Ilha Venil has also played a pivotal role in training in service teachers on pedagogical and content knowledge in her field, which is the field of uh, in, uh, English and also moral studies. Yeah? And she was awarded excellent teachers in moral education from the year 2008 until 2015. Currently, Dr. Ilha Venil is attached to the curriculum development division, leading the research and classroom assessment unit. So it's all to you, Dr. Uh, thank you, Datin, our dear moderator. It's a, a pleasure to meet all of you. Uh, actually, I've, I've um, requested, uh, not requested, I've uh, wished that I would, will be able to meet all of you face to face at the auditorium of the Faculty of Education. But unfortunately, we, can't, we cannot do that now. So uh, this is the best alternative that we can have it. Okay, uh, through to the Zoom meeting. Uh, I've been working in uh, the Curriculum Development Division for the past four years, or it's fondly known as BPK. And since 2017, we have uh, implemented the KSSR, which is the revised 2017, and the KSSM. So um, in, in KSSR and KSSM in English, we call it as the primary, primary school standards-based uh, curriculum or, and the secondary school standards-based curriculum. So prior to that, uh, prior to the K KSSR revised 2017 and uh, KSSM, it was the KSSR which was implemented in the year 2011. But prior to KSSR 2011 was the revised um, uh, curriculum of the KBSR and the KBSM, if many of you all know about this. Okay, that was implemented in the year 2003. So um, what is the rationale of, of this revision? And I'm sure many students uh, of the uh, Faculty of Education will definitely, they will definitely go through in their course, right, about the curriculum. So definitely, when, uh, why, why is the rationale for this revision is definitely fulfilling the need of the curriculum cycle. And I'm sure you've been exposed to it, the curriculum cycle. Uh, another reason for that is to administer up-to-date uh, content and uh, what do you call and pedagogy, as well as there's request for change where, where, where we gathered uh, information from seminars and conferences. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for today's uh, agenda on my side, I will be sharing with you all about three aspects which I would like to share with you right now. All right, can everybody see that? All right. 
All right, gaining permission. I'll be talking on these three aspects, gaining permission from MOE, especially those of you who would like to do research, especially in government schools. All right. And then uh, what are the research scope that we can concentrate on in these times? And then how to uh, successfully complete your PhD? I guess the third agenda, many students would like to hear that. Okay, let me go through the second slide first. Okay. Um, probably I should share it this way. Okay. Right, if you want to gain permission from MOE, especially from the Educational Planning and Research Development Division, Okay, I'm from BPK, I'm from a different division, Curriculum Development Division. So if you want to apply uh, to gain permission to get into schools, to do research in schools, especially in government schools, you need to um, apply this through the Educational Planning and Research Development Division. Now, how can you go about it is just to type, now everything is done online. Okay, you need to go into uh, ERAS 2.0. So it looks like that. When you go into ERAS 2.0, which is ERAS 2.0 means Educational Research Application System. Okay, hold on. Okay, next one. This is how you're supposed to go about it. All right, you just need to type https double dot uh, double slash eras.moe.gov.my. All right, once we have typed into that, then it will go into your um, it will go into this, you will look into this kind of uh, surface, all right? Application research application system. So uh, in that, uh, you need to apply for your ID and password. And once it is generated, even before, before it's generated and given to you, you are able to read the guidelines, the guidelines of this uh, application and the conditions uh, given to that. So you need to read it. And once you are given the ID and password, all right? Um, so there are four things actually, there are four things you need to do, which is um, to upload four documents, all right? One is the verification letter from the university, all right? And then there's another form uh, generated by EPRD, which I told you before, which is the um, educational planning and research development. It's a form which you have to fill it in, okay? And then you have to upload it again. All right, now thirdly, which is so important, uh, research proposal, the research proposal and your research instruments that you intend to use. So now in your research proposal, you need to state very clearly, all right, how you're going to do your research, especially in the methodological part. You need to tell what is your sample size, all right, how many respondents that you need to, uh, that you're going to have, all right, and how you're going to collect your data. Are you going to do it manually? or are you going to uh, do it in Google form? So right now, uh, as you can see with the pandemic around, you can uh, probably using the Google form is the, is the easiest and the best way to do so, right? So uh, you need to state that very clearly. And usually they will give you the, uh, once you have uploaded those forms and they will take around probably a week to return to you, uh, to give you the permission letter, okay? Like during my time, I, I had to do it manually. I had to drive all the way to EPRD, to the division. I have to send in my proposal. I have to fill up the form. I have to send the verification letter from the university that I am a student from the university. And then I think they, take, they took about three weeks to return, to reply to me, all right? That, uh, that my permission was granted. And then I can proceed to go to the schools, provided you do not disturb the teaching and learning of the of the uh, of those teachers. Okay, so that's one. Right now, the research scope. I think I have around about five minutes more to speak on this. Right, the research scope. As we all know, everybody has been talking about IR four point zero. So nowadays, of course. Um, they would definitely like students to do on AI, artificial intelligence, big data, internet of things, robotic, and so on. But as we all know, uh, we cannot just simply uh, depend on entirely on technology. It's not just technology alone, all right? Sometimes you can also put in how can we incorporate values, values into the technology. 
I still remember when I was uh, attending a conference in, in Australia, there was a PhD student who did, um, who developed video games, all right, video games on, on, on developing empathy among children. All right, so that's going to be a kind of interesting thing. As we know, technology is a tool. It's just a tool to uh, what you call, uh, in order for us to disperse our knowledge. So another point of interest is the classroom assessment. Nowadays, many teachers are, have been encouraged to, uh, to do classroom assessment, which comprises uh, formative and summative assessment. So this is to, to detect the progress of the student. And this is very important before they sit for the major ex uh, exam, especially for SPM. So you can also concentrate on that based on your, your particular subjects or your, your favorite subject that you would like to do. And another part is on pedagogies. That means the approaches and strategies to teaching and learning in the 21st century. Probably you can concentrate on project-based learning. Uh, this is like project-based learning is nothing so new. It has been there for ages, but probably we are concentrating more now more so when we have you know, a multidisciplinary approach uh, where various subjects have been intertwined and you know, how we can carry this out where the students, uh, where we teach students to look for, for information, uh, we, we teach students how to plan, all right, how to implement the projects and so on. So lastly, how to be caught successful, how to complete successfully in your PhD. Okay, all right. All right, there's, there's three things that I would like to touch on. Okay, uh, let me see. I have about one and a half minutes to touch on this. First of all, you need to have perseverance. There's no shortcuts, ladies and gentlemen. There's no shortcuts. You need to have, uh, you need to persevere. That means overcoming a difficult situation through strong determination. Okay, uh, probably you, you may have a um, few challenges coming in. Suddenly, uh, your child gets sick, or suddenly um, any one of your um, what do you call family members uh, are in, is in the hospital, and then uh, suddenly you, you suddenly you feel that there's no mood for you to to continue your PhD. And then I think you need to have you need to overcome that difficult situation. It doesn't come all in one shot, but you need to have that. Uh, secondly, persistence or tenacity. That means you need to continue the task in spite of difficulty until achieving the goal. All right. One good, uh, and, uh, one good example will be you try to look for your research gap. Okay. You keep looking and looking for your research gap and you still can't find it. All right. You've been reading a lot. So, um, so you need to to, to be persistent, you need to continue reading until you find your research gap, okay? It is, it is difficult, but you shouldn't give up. It's, it's a continuous process. Thirdly, you need to be disciplined. All right, discipline in the sense that when, when you're given a task, let's say for, if for full-time students, right, you need to be doing your work from, you know, it's like an office job, from probably eight, to five or nine to four, you need to have that almost every day, okay? Almost every day. Like me, I, I do it every day, including Saturday and Sunday. That is to make up the time, let's say, you know, suddenly, um, suddenly at one point, you are unable to concentrate due to, due to unforeseen uh, circumstances. That would really make up to it. So including Saturday and Sunday, I would really sit down and I would really do it. And also concentrate on one or two hobbies that you really love. Like for me, for instance, I have, uh, I'm also an Indian classical dancer. So while doing, uh, doing my studies at five o'clock, I'll stop and I'll go for my dance class. So during the daytime while I was studying, I was thinking, okay, I have something very interesting to do at the end of it. I'm going for my dance class. So that keeps me going, all right, to do. So it has to be consistent, it has to be disciplined. It's not like 10 minutes you read and then you go to the fridge, you take a bar of chocolate. And then after that, after 10 minutes, you go to the fridge and you take a tub of ice cream to eat. Okay, and then suddenly you feel like talking to a friend and then you speak to your friend for an hour. So you, you can't be doing that in order for you to successfully finish in three or four years. So that discipline is very, very important in order for you to finish it. 
And uh, before I end my, my talk here, you need to have the growth mindset. That means every day is a learning, some, you are learning something new every day. At least write a paragraph or write something when you've read something, you need to read, you need to write it out probably almost every day. Write, write a paragraph or write a page. And coupled with a healthy diet, you need to eat well, okay? You need to exercise and you need to have good sleep. You need to have about seven to eight hours of sleep. I do not believe that you should have sleep for just for three, four hours because you need to have good rest so that the following day you're able to uh, get up and you're able to concentrate well. So that's all I would like to share. Um, thank you so much and uh, back to you. Um, Nothing. Back to you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ilhaven. Yeah? Um, what she said is so true, yeah? The persistence and also the growth mindset. Now, just for your information, some of the, the content of the speakers, actually, we asked the, uh, the postgraduate students from MU, what do you want to hear? And so the, 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 the speakers are actually touching on things that you want to hear. And I remember, I mean, so what, what uh, Dr. Ilhavenio says, bring me back to my own memory. You know, those times when we were doing PhD, we, we have to be persistent because we have been asked, what is your theoretical framework? And we cannot find our theoretical framework. Oh, those were the time. Now, Dr. Vinil, there is a question there about if says that the researcher is not from the university, but it is from the school who intend to do a research. Do they need to also attach verification letter? Do you know that? Okay, if, if the researcher is from the school, but it's the researcher attached to the university at the moment. Uh, if, if it's in the school and if the researcher is doing the research in the school, then I think you don't have to attach the letter. But let's see if the if the the, what do you call the researcher is uh, is currently attached to uh, the university full time and intending to go back and do the collect the data from the school then yes you need to attach you need to attach the letter definitely but i think if 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 a teacher wants to do another want to collect data in another school probably he or she might need to get some permission right yes yes you need to you need to do that uh, one more question uh, to you, uh, Dr. Vinil, is that uh, what about in time of pandemic? How do we get permission? Do we need permission if you want to collect data? Yes, definitely. Yeah, in terms of this pandemic, uh, for those of you, that is why I stated just now, um, you still need to do, because everything is done online, you need to upload it online. So your collection of data, you need to state very clearly in your, in your proposal. How are you going to collect the data? So will they be allowed to enter school to collect data? Um, they will be allowed provided, uh, provided that uh, you, what do you call, you are not disturbing the teaching and learning of the, of the teachers in the classroom. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ilha Vinil. Um, we will come to our next speaker. Thanks, Dr. Vinil. Uh, we probably will have more questions later on, yeah? Okay, now our next speaker is Dr. Diane Cheong. Dr. Diane has a PhD in information system that's different from the rest of us from University of Malaya. Her expertise is mainly in modeling intelligent systems with cyber behaviorism. This is truly for IARIA. Yeah? Several of her research has cyber footprints for future works, notably detecting gender deception on the internet and decision problem structuring system for novices. As an associate professor in artificial intelligence and an academia with UITM for 34 years, uh, Diane Cheong brings with her a wealth of knowledge and experience as a research coordinator to MNNF network. Diane Cheong was a productivity software training for MOE and UITM. Additionally, she was a publishing chair for IEEE conference, research grants reviewer and panelist for MOE, and a TRIS practitioner. 
Presently, she conducts research methodology and writing a winning research proposal workshops. She sits on an international jury panelist in innovations, inventions, and design competitions. To you, Dr. Diane. Good afternoon. Thank you, moderator. All right. I'm uh, I try to bring in, you know, the current status of our time here. We are aware that the COVID-19 pandemic has intensified challenges faced by researchers to education. It has prompted further research towards distance learning, remote learning, open learning, collaborative learning, online learning and blended learning. The teaching and learning landscape will be changed permanently. Remote learning is forced onto an educational system already struggling with digital infrastructures and technologies. The shift to distance learning has been a logistic nightmare for schools that have long lacked enough classrooms, teachers, and educational equipment. I will take you to look into the four spots of the teaching and learning landscape, namely remodeling the curriculum, data collection, digitalization, and the home internet. Remodeling of curriculum. In most circumstances, the forces for change, either scientific, technological, economical, social, or cultural, call for curriculum restructuring and renewal of policies for education and training, as well as the monitoring and assessment of performance. However, the pandemic has added a new dimension and at the same time reveals the strength and weakness of the educational system. Evidently, it necessitates more effective curriculum and pedagogical innovations to be designed as the learning and teaching has been upended with the unprecedented events ushered in by the pandemic. We have rational models such as Tyler model, Hilda Tava model. We also have the cyclical model such as Wheeler model, Nichols and Nichols model. And there's a dynamic interaction model such as Walker model, Skewback model that can be revisited to review or readjust to meet the rising expectations of basic schooling within the SOP of the pandemic. So research titles that claim the remodeling of the curriculum with the pandemic challenges should reflect the relevant research methods. Incidentally, the skill back model is widely used in healthcare. Now I take you to look into data collection, how it can be done. Most frequently used research methods include the following, participant, non-participant observation, survey, comprising interview and questionnaires. We have focus group, experiments, secondary data analysis, that's archive study, and mixed method. Presently, the physical activities of data collection has been grounded to a halt. The pandemic SOP necessitates the creative approaches of technology to be deployed. Social networks such as Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and YouTube 
can be used for creating and sharing stories, pictures, videos, and memes. Past successful practices and behavior are probably not doing too well in the new reality of today. Since the novel coronavirus appeared la late last year, there have been more than 4,000 academic papers relating to the pandemic have appeared online without the benefit of a full paper, I'm sorry, full peer review process. Published articles or preprint papers based on flawed research contribute to misinformation, disinformation, or malinformation. Notably, researchers have to be media literate, which is the ability to assess, analyze, evaluate, create, and act according, act accordingly, and have all forms of communication. Truly, the information minefield is overloaded with deep fake and deep state. It is wise to check on the links and sources. Now I take you to another spot. I call it the digitalization. The, um, the adoption of online learning represents a timely opportunity for educators and students to build their digital skills. The learning curve is steep to manage time, work independently, remain disciplined, and know how to get the best out of virtual meetings. And we have schools having to be replicated in homes and enlist the help of parents and guardians as co-teachers. Most students opted to use digital or printed learning materials or modules to read at home with the guidance of their elders before carrying out specific activities. Most of them lack computers and reliable internet connections. Some families prefer their children to get lessons online or through regional radio and TV broadcasts. Conceptually, it is homeschooling, which may overwhelm the parents. The parents were not prepared to handle online learning or guide the students through modules provided by the teachers. On another note, content creators are to be appreciated for their efforts. They have painstakingly researched, analyzed, ideate, write, photograph, and film to create appealing contents to be shared on social platforms as educational materials. So digitalization must be embraced as a broad-based strategy in different dimensions. Moreover, resources and technical supports are to become adept in digital technologies. The resources and technical support are to be assured of access to affordable and quality digital infrastructure and technologies. Besides, a sustainable digitalization comes with underlying conditions of cybersecurity, data privacy, and trustworthy digital network. Lastly, I would like to touch on a home internet, as this seems to be a major problem among students, teachers, and uh, educators at large. Home internet connection is of utmost importance in remote learning. 
and unstable network connection is often due to the distribution of the signal in the rooms. As Wi-Fi is shared among phones, TVs, and tablets, each device tends to receive significantly less bandwidth than the actual bandwidth provided by the internet connection. Wi-Fi may be convenient, but you have to remember it is a radio technology. So wherever possible, stationary devices should be connected to the router with an ethernet cable. A wireless router can transmit ideally up to 30 meters. Structural peculiarities such as glass panels, aquariums, and walls with wire mesh can affect the Wi-Fi signal. We can use repeaters to strengthen a Wi-Fi signal. This receiver, oh, sorry, this receive the router's signal and set up a Wi-Fi connection of their own to broker the data packets going in both directions. It is a simple repeater with only one radio module for both directions. Then the data throughput will be halved. If the signal is to be distributed over two floors, it is advisable to use a mesh system. A mesh system is a wireless network consisting of at least two components with two or more radio modules. These components can talk to each other to coordinate which one supplies to which end device. Alternatively, a power line adapter is useful for devices that are hard to reach by a network cable. Here, the signal is transported by an existing power grid. Power line adapter also comes with ethernet connections and it should be plugged into the wall sockets for non-interference. So I hope it helps with this uh, extra piece of information on your home internet. So in conclusion, the COVID-19 crisis shows no sign of abating. However, with the epidemic prevention protocols, we can leverage the power of digital technologies to overcome the challenges presented. I guess that's my sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Diane. Dr. Diane has raised issues about, uh, there were some findings and um, it, it's relating, it's related to a question that have been asked by a few of our participants. That is, you know, like if we know that you need the socket and you know that the signal is this and this, so why aren't the policymakers in the Ministry of Education take note of all these findings? So mm -hmm. why, is, why are the research findings not being used? in a crude language by the Ministry of Education. Dr. Raya, you want to say something about uh, accusation? Is that yeah. right? <laughs> yes, Dr. Uh, thank you. Um, it's a very good question. I mean, in fact, um, when we did our PhD, we asked the same questions as well, uh, didn't we? Um, uh, now that I'm in the policy unit, um, actually, uh, I didn't realize that um, when we, um, where PPG is concerned, because a lot of our policy decisions or policy papers that we are preparing um, uh, at this level, we need to collect information, we need to read some literature, we need to um, be able to make sense of things before we suggest uh, a lot of things that, that um, that we are going to put down in that uh, policy paper or kertas dasar. So this is the, the time when we um, will get all the literature, the information, the research and all that um, in, and, and read all those papers 
in order to make an informed decisions and also uh, in preparing the proposal of that, uh, whatever policies that we are putting or policy papers that are putting forward. So it's not directly in bulk that we uh, suddenly rush to go into the PhD thesis and then, and then use it arbitrarily, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a process and, a, and, and um, a practice that uh, is on the ground where when it comes to the execution, like preparing a policy paper, that's when we will retrieve all these uh, findings or the research or any literature that can help us prepare that policy paper um, effectively. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Rahayan. Yeah. What about Dr. Rainio? When we develop curriculum, do we actually look at the research findings, especially of postgraduate students? Yes, um, Datin Dr. Ng Subun, yes, we do, um, especially where the subject officers will definitely um, get hold of those uh, research, what do you call, a thesis done by the students of the university. And, and especially now, okay, um, we've been told to uh, really uh, do deep research, especially on literature review. So students' thesis will definitely be our one of our agendas to look through it. And especially EPRD officers also, because whatever we are, we have done. Whenever, let, let's say, uh, we are actually the HLP, uh, we are the scholar, scholars of HLP. We'll definitely will have to give a copy of our thesis to, to the EPRD library. So all these, uh, they will definitely do their research there. That, that's my... yeah. Thank you, Dr. Venel. Mm -hmm. So this bring us to what Dr. Shoet has said about rigorous, valid, and also professionalism in doing, in conducting research. Therefore, our fellow postgraduate students and also lecturers, therefore, there is a need for us to do very rigorous, uh, your PhD or your master thesis need to be very rigorous because the Ministry of Education policymaker do look at some of this uh, research findings. I mean, I'm, I was from there too. I mean, we don't tell the whole world that we are doing, we are looking at this thesis and all, but we do look at uh, research uh, findings. So, uh, Dr. Shui, can you say something towards that? I mean, from the point of view of the academician, do you think what Dr. Vinil and also uh -huh. Yaya said, is it true? Oh, oh, they never they never look at our research. What do you think? Raja, Dr. Shoyed. Thank you, Dr. Ng. Uh, I, I, I would like to ask this, this question. Anna. We can categorize ourselves whether one is whether we are policy maker, number two, whether we are policy analyst, or number four, whether we are doing uh, the research that we are doing in terms of policy is for the sake of doing for academic purposes. So if we are, for example, uh, conducting a research that uh, touches on a policy aspects, right? Uh, and then at the day we come up with findings and we may come up with certain recommendations. And then uh, these recommendations, I mean, uh, to, to me as an academic, is right, not a must to the ministry to take it and to decide and to follow our recommendations because there are many aspects that they have to consider before they change a policy, for example, before they, uh, if you want to say they uh, take off the, the policy or they repeal with a new policy and so on. Uh, this is something that we have to bear in mind that as a researcher, I, I, I look into this as an exercise or as a, a work that we have to complete. And then we propose whatever we find to the ministry is up to them to decide whether they want to follow or not. In my experience conducting research with ministries, I think I have come across few of our research have been used by the ministry in terms of the, uh, the policy changes, policy development and so on. And then we cannot expect them to take 100% of our policy recommendation, for example, I mean, they must take, no, no. I mean, they are the, the, the main stakeholder. I mean, they have to consider many aspects. They are looking into the whole pop the whole country. You know, we are looking from the researcher's perspective. So definitely, uh, I, I, don't, I don't blame them. 
I mean, uh, of course, uh, we, some some researchers they are being fra they become frustrated because the what uh, our findings uh, are not used at all. But you don't. I mean, don't don't think that way because I think the ministries are looking. They are looking into that, but may not be the right time to change or may not be the right time to follow our recommendations. That that's my view. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shoei. You truly understand policy. From my experience, um, many a times, because uh, the, the studies by the postgraduates, for example, sometimes is only limited to a certain scope, right? So when you want to look at it at a more macro level, um, there are things that you cannot immediately implement. Right? So thank you, Dr. Shoei, for your, uh, for your input. So Dr. Diane, Yes, would you say to that the status of us, uh, the purpose of doing research, if we look at critical theory, is that the research finding is useful. So, what do you think of that? The comment that um, why is there a gap between research and practice? It all depends on your research area. If you are into systems, or you are modeling some aspect of human behavior or even the teaching and learning, you know, pedagogy, you can actually implement it into a system. And uh, if a system is reliable and it has been truly tested, you know, you can even commercialize it. Uh, how should I say, you know, in our teaching and learning landscape, we need a lot of content creators to add value to our concept presentation, our not imparting of knowledge. So, you know, all, all these materials, right, done by content creators, you know, you can actually like I would always advise my uh, students or supervisors to you know develop those content uh, content and then approach the ministry, <laughs> the minister of uh, ministry of education, to take up whether you know they want mass production to, to as teaching aids in school. I know there are books now. Books for special children. Like written by, uh, I think that's one that came out, you know, uh, by a Minyuri teacher, and her book, her books, are being uh, sort of commercialized by the education department for special needs kids. You can, you know, whatever your research product, try it at, uh, you know, convention, at uh, the IID. Invention, innovation, design, competition, and see how it goes from there. If there's commercial value, well, you know, instead of uh, uh, being like you may be not so keen, uh, the Ministry of Education is not keen to take up your research product, at least you have other avenues, you see. It's more like self fulfillment. You know, PhD is all about self fulfillment. So whether you add value to society or to the community, but at least it add value to your life perspective. Thank you, Dr. Diane. I once was in a was in a, a forum where these questions was asked to a speaker who is a renowned speaker. So, and that speaker told us that it was in, in it was in London. Yeah, the speaker told us that well. You don't need to wait for the big policy makers. You mm -hmm. are the policy maker in your own classroom. So you can change your own classroom. Don't need to wait for the big policy makers. Maybe that's what mm -hmm. that's what Dr. Diane is saying. Now I want to ask a final question over here. Something that has been raised by one or two, about two of the participants here, which is what are the issues currently in the main in the middle management in schools in terms of uh, raising the quality of the teachers and also um, what are the issues about management that uh, 
is is good to be researched on. Maybe Dr. Rohaya or any one of you about school management, research on school management. Um, there are a lot of uh, our teachers, uh, even at middle uh, level, uh, are doing uh, masters in educational management and leadership. Uh, surprisingly, um, but they are practicing teachers as well. I mean, they remain uh, after they get their masters. They they are still um, in schools, mm, full time teachers. Um, maybe to prepare themselves more in terms of um, if they want to climb up the ladder of management um, in the administration uh, position. Um, so uh, actually, um, if anyone is very familiar with IAB, we have an extensive research uh, masters and PhD in management and leadership stored in that um, resource center uh, in IAB. Um, either in Genting or in uh, Exeter, uh, in NSTEC. Uh, so, um, yeah, we, we do have uh, a considerable um, amount of research done on the education management um, and educational leadership. And I, I think um, our teachers are very familiar about um, a lot of um, uh, different levels of management because they themselves are involved in managing um, a lot of things in schools. More so if they are um, panitia heads um, or subject heads um, and also um, maybe senior assistants um, and also the heads of schools. So yes, um, I, I would say that uh, there are a lot of education management researchers around here. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Rohaya. Now we have come to the end of the of the webinar, but I would like to give maybe each of the panel maybe one minute or, or half a minute to just say something. Dr. Shuib, I'm following the screen there. Is there any advice that okay. you want to give? A uh, very, very, you know, yeah, very brief. Okay, and uh, I, I just would like to to remind myself and our colleagues and our students that uh, conducting academic research is uh, significant to the improvement of our education, uh, whether education systems or education policies, or even to the extent of uh, students' uh, outcome, because this is the, the most important thing in our uh, education uh, environment. So um, what we have to uh, always remember that there are things that we have to follow. There are rules, there are regulations, um, there are procedures that we have to follow and uh, make sure we do not go beyond uh, the boundary that we are allowed to do uh, research. Um, so long as, uh, doesn't mean that we, we can do, but uh, so long as we are doing it uh, within the boundary, uh, go ahead and um, uh, be patient. Uh, be respectful and be truthful in our uh, academic uh, research. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chui. You mean that we don't look at the regulation as something which is confining us, but as something that will help us to produce good work. Now, Dr. Vinil, Dr. Vinil, can you also address very, a, a little bit that they asked there? Now, what to do? How? What kind of advice you can give to part-time students? Yeah. Okay. Um... To the dear part-time students, um, what I would like to say is uh, besides the three qualities that I have mentioned just now, you need to persevere, you need to be persistent, uh, you need to be persistent, you need to be disciplined. Um, at the same time, you also need support from your family members as well as your employers as well. It's good that your employers know that you are do also doing your, your, your studies so that they also will support you uh, because the motivation is very, very important. Yeah. And then uh, besides that, your family members, definitely your, you need support from your loved ones, uh, right? To know that you are, you are doing it, uh, you know, for, to better yourself and also to better the society and so on. So if you feel tired, and I'm sure I'm not the best person to advise on this because I've done my PhD full time. So you, you also can get advice from those of them who have completed their PhD doing part-time successfully. It's good to ask advice from them. And when I speak to those who have done it uh, part-time, they have done it successfully. So when they are tired, what they do is they, they, they when they come back from work, they sleep, they, 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 go, they have a rest first. 
All right, and then after that, they continue. And, and of course, the, the qualities is, you need to have uh, what you call double the qualities that, that I have mentioned just now. Talking mm -hmm. about perseverance, talking about persistence, you need to have double, double that amount to do it. And I know that many of them that, that have completed successfully, uh, they, they compromise on their sleep, especially. And they compromise on their sleep and hats off to them, actually, that, that they have done it well. So that's all I would like to say. Back to you, Dathin. Okay, thank you, Vin. Thank you, Dr. Vinil. Yeah, everybody has to sacrifice something. So when I was doing those, those time when I study, I sacrificed on going to to do mark to do uh shopping and all. So I make that decision. I think that's what you're trying to say. Now uh Dr. Diane, you yes. have a short one, maybe the last two. Oh yes. Now when you do research, we always start with a title. You know, don't worry about the title. We always have a working title. Then in the in the progress of your PhD journey, you may somehow find an area that you really have a passion with. Well, it's all right to go back to the title, you know, and uh, you can uh, switch a bit. Then again, then you go back to your research methodology, the way you collect data, your research methods and so forth, right? And finally, when you write, as you write, you realize that your title doesn't reflect the content. Well, not to worry about that. Go and write again the title in as few words as possible but it must reflect the content of your research i i guess that's what we all have gone through you know changing titles i started mine with collaborative learning from collaborative learning i moved on to online learning then later i realized oh no i like management information system so i'm good at modern system so there I suddenly switch from all kinds of learning into conceptualizing a system. So not to worry about titles. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Diane, which is very true. I mean, currently I'm supervising students. They want everything to be perfect before they collect data. <laughs> you cannot, yeah? Mm -hmm. right, now, Dr. Rohaya, maybe this is a very short one from you. Um, yes, um, a very short one. Um, I think to all the researcher students out there, um, don't, don't worry about being accurate the first time. I think it's a learning process that's very beneficial and very fruitful uh, in the journey of completing a PhD. Um, the end product, yes, is the certification, but um, as we all know, it's the journey that is so significant in one's life um, that gives you all the insights of things and also make you uh, more um, mature in, 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 in terms of um, thinking about things, in terms of looking at things uh, from multiple perspectives uh, with the experience that you have gone through. Um, um, hats off to all everybody who already um, completed the journey and also uh, to those who are already um, within the journey in order uh, to complete uh, their, their own uh, journey of knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rohaya. Yes, truly said, truly, she has, she has mentioned it. In fact, when you do your PhD or your master, it is practicing all the higher order thinking that we have been trying to, to get it to the students. Now, we have come to the end of the webinar. Thank you very much for the participation of all. And thank you also to all the EXCO for the contribution which made this a, a success. A special thank to Dr. Norizan. Dr. Norizan has designed the brochure and have communicated with all of you. Um, before we end, we would like to inform you that e-certificate will be sent to all of you. Can I invite Dr. Norizan? Maybe can you just inform them about the e-certificate? Dr. Norizan, are you there? Dr. Norizan, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, do you mind to tell them something about the e-certificate? E-certificate will email to you. Uh, at the moment, uh, we have some of you that uh, registered with us, but then uh, we don't know exactly who 
uh, you are some using numbers, some using nicknames at the participant list. So uh, what I would like you is to respond to the email that I sent those who have registered early. You respond to the email telling us that you are in the room, in this room today. And those who just come in and uh, impromptu for the meeting today, uh, I need your address, uh, your email address also. Uh, can you write in the chat room here your email address? Then we will email to you the certificate. Uh, is it all right? Thank you, Dr. Norizai. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Norizai. Yeah. So uh, please write down your detail at the uh, at at the chat here, right? Or yeah, at the chat box here. Yeah. So that Dr. Norizai and uh and team will will uh, handle your e certificate. Yeah. So again, on behalf of the association. The alumni of uh, Faculty of Education, University of Malaya. We thank you all for participating in this webinar, and uh, also thank you for the support from the Faculty of Education and also our dear president. Yeah. So uh, we probably not we probably right, uh, Dr. Zainal. We will be organizing some other event, maybe through the to some other platform. Yeah. So we will inform you from time to time. This is our payback time from the uh, from being the uh, student and then alumni. So this is our payback time to the universities, to the faculty, and also to the education fraternity. So thank you very much and good evening to all of you. And especially thank you to the four speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Ratin. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Judy. See you all again. Bye. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Pro Raida. Looking forward to more. <laughs> thank looking you. forward for, for, for more activities. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Enjoy your PhD <laughs> journey. Yeah, yeah. Enjoy your PhD. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, thank, you, thank you, Prof. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate this forum. Thank you, yeah. thank you very much. Appreciate it, truly. Thank you very You're much. Welcome. Thank you for sharing. Thank you, Prof. Thank you.